I will introduce our speakers. Then I will spend uh, a few minutes giving some background to the to the discussion, and then I will refer back to the speakers, and we will open with interventions of around five six minutes from from each, and then with that we will open open to the floor for questions and comments, and hopefully we can have some debate about about the topics. Well, uh, from left to, to my close left, I want to introduce to Christian Del Valle. Christian is founder and managing partner of Altilia Equosphere and Altilia Climate Fund. Uh, before, he has served as director of environmental markets and forestry at BNP Paribas. Then uh, we have to uh, Richard, Richard McNally. Richard is a global coordinator for climate change, SNB, and he has been working as environmental economist, leading several uh, global projects, including red projects. Then we have to Agus Sari. Agus is the CEO of Belantara Foundation, primarily with work in Indonesia. And before that, he has served in different positions uh, in Indonesia, including the task force for, for red. And he has been actively uh, leading efforts to design financial mechanisms you know, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions in, in Indonesia. So he has a really active role in the country. Then uh, we have to uh, Obadia Ngigi. Obadia is a co-founder and CEO of Farmers Life East Africa, which is a company aimed at helping financial institutions and farmers to overcome challenges associated with climate change, mainly in, in Kenya, if I'm right. Uh, then we have to Sylvia Wisniewski. Uh, Sylvia is managing director at Finance in Motion, which is an impact investment group, and she oversees the company's financing initiatives for conservation of natural resources. And then uh, we have to Chris Brown. Chris is a vice president and corporate responsibility and sustainability of Olam International. So it's a quite distinct group of, of people. There's lots of uh, knowledge in our panelists. So I will just spend a few minutes to provide some background to, to the discussion that we want to have. And uh, the questions that we want to explore in this panel are mainly related to three basic questions. One is more uh, related to how to mobilize long-term uh, finance for investments aim at supporting sustainable agriculture and conservation, but at the same time providing uh, social benefits and how is that smallholders can benefit from those investments. The second is more looking at what kind of uh, investment and business schemes uh, can be more effective you know, for transferring finance and uh, some other services to smallholders and SMEs and what works better in which, which type of context, etc. And the third one is, has more to do with issues of scaling up. We all know that scaling up uh, initiatives that work is very difficult and often all these investments, they are very successful in a specific project, a specific cases, in a specific geography. So, so that's an interesting topic to explore. Uh, well, we all know that uh, there's a need of long-term, large-scale investments for, for conservation, uh, production, and mainly uh, for smallholders and SMEs. Now, often these actors are disenfranchised. They face a lot of constraints, technical, organizational, financial, etc. So there's a need to deliver uh, more uh, funds and investments for these groups. And when they have access to these funds, often the conditions, the terms and conditions of these resources, they don't necessarily match with the reality of these farmers, of these groups. And often when they have access to informal finance, we know that informal finance is expensive. So, no, so there's need to mobilize the resources in ways that make sense for these actors, no? and also in ways that they can support upgrade of production systems, adoption of improved practices, and have benefits for them. And also we know that these players are, are over time engaging in markets that are much more demanding, more demanding in terms of quality, compliance with environmental standards. So uh, I think that imposes additional constraints in these players. Also, this 
discussion about how to mobilize resources that make sense and can, can help them to overcome these constraints make a lot of sense. So, um, and also finance at the same time shouldn't just be to support initiatives that you have in place, but to create options and to create new economic options for these players, which is important, but, but we know that it's well, easy to say, but it's difficult to put in practice. At the same time, there's a lot of uh, initiatives that have been emerging from the finance uh, sector that are more innovative, and I'm trying to, to link you know, the, the smallholder needs with the, uh, these new perspectives of investors to try to get some environmental, positive environmental and social outcomes. You know? and, and I think there's a lot of finance instruments that are, that are emerging, like, uh, I don't know, bundling different types of financial services, blending different types of capital, targeting incentives from governments to facilitate guarantees and capital for smallholders, leveraging the capacity of actors in the value chains and making use of new technologies. No? So I think there's an important set of uh, instruments, tools, and technologies that are being used. It's important to reflect how also they can have, uh, well, help to, to bridge no? uh, supply with demand of capital. And also, I think at the same time, we know that, uh, yeah, finance has to embrace uh, environmental and social goals, but Finance is not enough. Also, there's a lot of different conditions that have to be in place for finance and investments to have a positive outcome for the environment, for conservation, <coughs> for, for smallholders. And I think, well, the whole debate that now we are having is uh, also how that can be scaled up. Or if there are successful initiatives, how they can be scaled up at the level of the supply chain or putting in place business models that are more inclusive and really can deliver social and eco environmental outcomes at the same time. And here where we are having these discussions also on the landscape. So how to leverage the possibility that finance can have a bigger impact at the landscape. And that leads us to have a wider perspective on the possibilities and limits of, of, of finance. Uh, so uh, with that introduction, I would like uh, to ask some specific questions to our panelists, no, based based on these um, basic considerations, and I would like to start with with Sylvia. No, uh, you as uh, managing funds, as impact investor, where you are looking for uh, new ways to mobilize resources no, and to bring those resources that could have a meaningful impact on the environment and also to deliver some social benefits. No, could you tell us what are the challenges for bringing this? capital into this, uh, having in mind those objectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Pablo, for this uh, question, which I think many of you also share as a concern. I mean, we know definitely there are programs out there, there are government initiatives, we have international initiatives, but I think we're all very cognizant of the fact that this is not enough uh, and that private sector funding needs to be pulled in because of the enormous challenges that are out there. And if, if private sector money is not being mobilized, probably we are, we're just not going to make it. Um, and I think there's also a great opportunity actually at this point in time given the very low interest rate environment that particular Europe is facing. So many of the private investors actually look for alternatives right now and turn also to asset classes where they've never taken a look at before. Simply because uh, they know that the current alternatives that they have are in that sense not, not so interesting anymore or also have their their own new challenges. So in that sense, actually, we have a very good opportunity uh, at present to bring um, more private sector funding in, but how to actually make this work. Um, there's a lot of talk um, about impact investors today. You know, that, um, that there are certain foundations, high net worth individuals that look at these topics um, and are willing to, to basically put millions or even billions, you know, behind um, uh, the development agenda that we're all discussing here. However, I think we all need to be cognizant that though impact investors come with a development agenda, meaning that they have uh, social and environmental benefits in mind, first and foremost, these are investors, which means they look at a risk return equation first. And this is, I think, something where we need to understand to talk that language. Um, because they come with their metrics which is not necessarily what we probably have in mind if we talk government program or a GEF initiative or GCF initiative. Um, 
and also the terms that we used to use in our community of, you know, landscape restoration, conservation finance, Red Plaza, and you name it. These are acronyms and concepts that an impact investor is not used to. And finally, um, the other challenge that we have is this is an untested asset class. There's no track record. You don't have a 10 years or 15 years historic you know, track record of saying, okay, these are the probability of defaults, these are the returns that are being generated, these are the loss rates. You know, that doesn't really exist. So there are these challenges for an impact investor, even if that person or that foundation has a strong social mission, where you know, the risk return language you really cannot respond to because you know, we talk a different language than they do. So what can be done to, to actually address these issues? And, and what we found as a very interesting tool is um, uh, structured funds, which actually you know, represent a blended funding concept. Uh, where we try to bring together different investors from the public area, but also from the private area, and basically respond to their particular needs and to what they're looking for and what they can effectively deliver. It's very clear that uh, for an untested asset class, uh, a private investor first and foremost is interested to protect its principal, to protect its capital. We're not even talking now about returns. We're just about you know, talking about not losing the money, being sure that you're not losing the money in something. So risk protection is a big, big issue, and this is what we're you know, trying to solve through so-called structured funds. And what does this mean, a structured fund? I don't know whether any of you has ever eaten uh, a German black forest cake. Hands up of those who have this. Oh, great, thank you. I will tell our bakery back home that uh, we finally made it to bring something you know, uh, also here to Marrakech. Um, so, um, as you know, this is some sort of a layered cake. You know, you have this dark biscuit at the bottom, and then you have the double cream, and then the, the cherries, and mm, yeah, I see. Sorry, I didn't bring any pieces for you. Sorry, <laughs> next time. Uh, then there's another double, you know, double cream layer, and then on top again, you know, the biscuit, and on top, you know, you have then the cherries. And normally you eat this from top to down, right? I mean, you start obviously from you know, picking the cherry which is on top, uh, and then you eat from, from, top and from the top to the bottom. Um, how the structured funds work is the other way around. So you have these different slices, these different layers, and everyone has a different risk return profile, which means those that are the bottom, you know, these are those that get eaten first if there is a loss. Yeah? So if you use that pool of money that re is represented by the, you know, uh, cake, if, if you invest that money and you have some losses because some investments don't come back, you know, those that are in the lowest segment of the cake get eaten up first. Um, and if that you know, slice of the cake is being eaten up, then it moves on to the next layer if there are further and additional losses. And so hopefully you never make it to the top <laughs> because obviously you want to, to restrict your losses. But what it means for a private investor is you can choose where you want to go in. Generally, private investors want to be on top of the cake and benefit then from a 60-70% risk protection. So this is actually how you can pull in an investor which in principle is interested but has no idea about the actual asset class, about performance, about the risk profile, but through that additional protection that it gets through those investors which are below, which generally come from the public sector or the semi-public sector, you basically get into those funds. Just to give you an idea of scale and size of what we've been experiencing over the last um, uh, 10 years in, in funds that we are managing, uh, Accumulatively, we have mobilized more than 500 million euros in private funding. These are largely high net worth individuals, foundations, uh, but also pension funds. Um, and um, we know from other similarly structured funds that we are in that sense not a unique uh, animal, but that this is really a replicable, a replicable model. Uh, obviously, it also poses certain challenges because you're dealing then really with large-scale amounts and you need pipeline for these large-scale amounts. So you need to find also business models which respond uh, to this kind of financing. For example, a pension fund, they would never come with funding to you below 25 million at once. So you need to be able to place this. Um, the other challenge, obviously, is that um, the investors often talk also a slightly different language when it comes to impact. 
Um, so you have donors, which perhaps come with their particular agendas, some which may focus more on the gender aspect, some which focus more on the environmental aspect. Uh, while private investors, we found them in that sense um, more general, so that they look more at the bigger themes, not so much at the very specific micro effects. But to bring them together is not so easy always to align them on the development agenda and the impact indicators, et cetera, et cetera. And what is even more challenging, at least we find this more and more, is the timing dimension. If you convince a private investor to come in, that investor wants to put the money tomorrow. With public investors, you know, you can spend two or three years to get the funding in place. We had, for example, an experience with the Latin America Fund um, on conservation investments where we had just the German government funding in place and had talks with many other international finance institutions. But the next one who came in was actually a private investor because that investor was ready to spend immediately the money, though we had not even yet filled completely the cake in terms of the risk layers. But that private investor, for example, knew us from prior business, had trust in our business capacity and our judgment, and therefore was willing to basically do the bad and come in already earlier even than the other semi-public investors. So I think that's probably more and more a challenge going forward, that you know this alignment of timing, because public sector, and sorry if I'm stepping here on any toes, but public sector tends to take time. And this is not always what a private investor looks for. A private investor is probably more willing to have a more flexible approach perhaps on the impact metrics, but to be able to place funds. While with public investors, we find that even before we talk about the actual financing part, we talk long about the impact metrics and you know the targets and what you want to actually deliver on, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is a fair point. But if you then have a government change, if you have you know, a resetting of priorities, this can sometimes get very difficult. I stop here because I guess we will hear more about how then to place those funds and what are good and interesting business models. So let me stop here at that level of first bringing the money in. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. And a bit uh, to move ahead with the discussion, well, I would like to invite Richard because I think you have a lot of experience of probably building that pipeline of projects and, and what's possible in terms of timing for building the pipeline and also scales and you are working worldwide. So if you can share a bit your thoughts about how, how that's possible and to match with these needs of, of availability of, of funds. The ground level, s &V, of course, we're very much focused on working with smallholder farmers. We, we work across uh, 20 different commodities across 30 countries really focused on working with the smallholder and how we can transition working with the smallholder to a more sustainable uh, and inclusive business model. Um, you know, as part of this, we recognize that the, the smallholder farmer is, is one of the uh, groups which is having impact, environmental impact in terms of deforestation and uh, forest degradation. So we have set up a program within SNV called the uh, Red Energy and Agriculture Program to try to see how we can look at agriculture intensification and the impact that has on the on, on forestry, on deforestation or land expansion or, or land intensification as well as energy use. So as part of this work we've worked uh, int introduced this program across uh, a number of different countries and as part of this we've uh, identified a number of key factors which we think are, are critical uh, in terms of making that transition for smallholder farmers and, and SMEs. And one of those factors, uh, as, as Pablo mentioned in the introduction, is, is around finance. Uh, what we've found really is that there's not just one factor, but there's multiple factors really that we need to work on when we're working with smallholders. Um, these include, for example, things like greater smallholder organization, uh, working very much with the smallholders to work together to strengthen our bargaining power within a value chain with the companies, the, the mills or, or other groups along that value chain. Uh, very much trying to also work on the enabling environment, the governance issues around land, uh, land tenure, land conflict and so forth. Unless we're looking at these, these more difficult governance enabling conditions then it's very difficult for investors to be 
so interested in such a risky environment to, uh, to put their finance. Uh, a third element that we, we see as critical in terms of making that transition to, uh, for smallholders for sustainable deforestation free production is on providing service provision for better management practices. Really trying to work on those key issues to intensify production, to try to reduce the need to expand production into the, into the forest areas. And then finally, which is a topic of today, uh, is the issue around access to finance, the need to try to mobilize or support uh, smallholder farmers in accessing finance to be able to invest into their more sustainable uh, deforestation-free production. Uh, as Pablo highlighted, there's, uh, this is a, a key element, um, and uh, s and has been working across the world on this, uh, both in terms of trying to access domestic finance, which we think is critical if we're really looking at scaling up impact, but also looking at the more niche international impact investment finance, which, it, which potentially in the short term is going to be easier to access to make this transition towards more sustainable deforestation free. Again, focus very much at the smallholder um, level. From our experience, what we've found really is, is there's a lot of capital, a lot of potential uh, funds out there, but there's a number of different conditions which is really making it difficult for those funds to actually get down into uh, sustainable practices which are genuinely deforestation free or, or bit different to the, the business as usual. Um, some of those factors really, what we're seeing in our work is there's a real lack of bankable pipeline. Uh, it's quite hard to find uh, genuine projects uh, to invest into these, into these practices. Uh, s and we, we work primarily with small and medium enterprises and smallholders, and these are not so attractive to impact or, or larger investors, the so-called missing middle. Um, and finally, we see that there's a lot of risks, uh, particularly working on the land use area, the interface between agriculture, smallholder agriculture, and uh, deforestation. There's a lot of risks around governance and so forth, uh, which makes it very difficult for investors to be willing to to put their money behind it. So the models that we really try to practice, um, going back to uh, uh, Pablo's question, the, the models we try and practice really is we see a, a, a need for some form of transition finance, public financing, to try to work with these small and medium enterprises and, and formation of smallholder groups uh, using public finance to try to support them to get to more sustainable and inclusive practices. Uh, we, for example, have set up things like challenge funds or worked with challenge funds where we provide technical assistance to smallholders for uh, group formation for uh, tracing their supply chains or looking at sustainable practices as well as mentoring and providing investment into their actual, um, into their actual activities. Uh, what we've done in, in a number of cases is we've tried to build the environmental social governance standards of these uh, SMEs and smallholder groups. And then at the end of two or three years, uh, had matchmaking events where we tried to bring the investors to then work with these groups. Um, and at that point, they're far more commercially interesting uh, to be invested in. Uh, another model we use is we uh, set up platforms, again, we're looking at PPP, public-private uh, uh, funding systems, where we provide the training to help the smallholders on meeting environmental social criteria, for example, for certification or for deforestation-free practices. And after uh, two or three years, they're at a, a position they, they no longer need that training. Um, another issue, just one other issue to, to highlight from our experience of working is that even when <clears throat> we've seen an increased level of uh, impact investment or uh, domestic investment with higher in environmental social governance standards, there's also the issue of how to get the money down to the, to the right groups that you want to work with, and particularly the smallholders, which again is, is a focus for S&V and the, the small and medium enterprises, how the finance actually flows down there. These groups are often the ones with the, the worst, uh, are, are the highest risks to the investors. So we're seeing that the, 
those companies or groups with better ESG standards are able to access this finance, so it's creating a further division between those, those groups right at the bottom of the chain, the smallholders, and the, um, the ones higher up with, with uh, bigger operations are able to invest in environmental and social governance. So what we, what we need or what we've been trying to develop is a number of different models of how to uh, get the finance to the right groups um, and one case we have, uh, which we're working closely with um, a group called Financial Access and C4 and others, is trying to develop a model for replanting palm oil in, in um, and, and, and Belantara, uh, palm oil in Jambi in um, Indonesia. Here we're trying to access impact investors to provide the finance for the replanting working very much also, we provide technical assistance for um, looking at credit risk or financial modeling with the smallholders, bundling the, the smallholders into larger groups to make them more attractive for uh, uh, impact investors, and also doing agreements with mills and, and different groups further up the, the value chain to be able to source these, these, uh, uh, these products. So these, these are some of the models, um, which I, I can go into others, but I think in, in for time, I'll just uh, mention those that uh, SNV is currently um, uh, working on. Thank you, Richard. Uh, you mentioned the Bellantara Foundation and, and models that you are trying to develop in order to, bit, well, to reduce the negative environmental impacts that some commodities have and that involve a lot of smallholders, and Indonesia in a specific case. Also smallholders struggling to get access to finance, but at the same time they, they are struggling now to comply with the standards. And I think, well, you are engaged on, on those debates and also trying to mobilize finance in order to support more uh, local processes for achieving sustainability. Can you share a bit this your experience, Agus? Yes, thank you, <coughs> Pablo. Uh, my name is Agus Ari, I'm with Belantara Foundation, a new foundation that just was um, launched last year in Paris. Um, <clears throat> I think I'd like to go back a little bit to uh, why landscape matters. Um, I think uh, uh, landscape uh, to us is basically a place where uh, interconnectedness exists. Uh, these are interconnectedness among uh, stakeholders, those that uh, use and uh, get uh, benefits from the landscapes. And um, uh, we need to manage the interconnectedness because lacking which, we will basically uh, destroy the landscape. Having it managed well, we will uh, continue to uh, 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 use the landscape sustainably. Um, so, uh, and that is um, uh, basically the reason why we are, uh, we are um, uh, established to, uh, uh, to do conservation and restoration of forest and uh, peatlands in um, Indonesia um, through landscape approach. And um, we are uh, funded by private sector that uh, reside in the, in the landscapes. Um, um, it's basically um, uh, 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 two questions that we ask to the private sector, you know. First is whether you would be willing to co-manage uh, your landscapes, including financially. And then the second question we ask to the private sector would be whether you can afford not to. And usually the second question would be answered, yes, we cannot afford not to co-manage uh, our landscapes and therefore we would be willing to uh, 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 participate, including financially. So um, um, uh, through those uh, uh, questions to uh, several private sectors, we uh, get our fund. And the first uh, that we um, obtained was uh, from Asia Pulp and Paper, which already has um, its um, uh, zero deforestation policy. And we actually like to work with especially companies which have zero de deforestation policies. Um, so that's landscape. Now, within the landscape, there are, um, of course, in, in addition to large companies like APP, we have um, uh, 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 supposedly protected areas, uh, national parks, um, uh, natural reserves, but also communities. Communities that work in uh, uh, many different uh, 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 ways of lives, including uh, 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 smallholder farming. <coughs> And that um, is uh, the topic of, um, of today, um, is how to basically bring uh, uh, financing to 
uh, to them. Um, we've been in discussion. I think this 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 group is very interesting because uh, uh, um, uh, these are really uh, 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 you know a group of friends. I've been um, in very very close um, discussion with Chris and also uh, working very, very closely with SNV in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, uh, and uh, um, there are a number of things that um, probably um, I'd like to uh, raise as you know, some of the issues that need to be, um, uh, to be addressed when we talk about uh, uh, financing. First is that um, uh, usually when we talk about impact investors, we are talking about big, uh, large, amount, large numbers, some millions of dollars. And the bridge between that millions of dollars to small farmers actually is a big issue. How to basically deliver it to uh, the farmers. Um, um, and that includes you know, the issue of intermediary, but also what we call the last mile. You know, how to get to the, basically the end uh, 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 point of where the money should go. And we need to have innovation there. For example, with uh, Finance Access and, and SNV, we put together um, this, um, an APFO, yeah? Put together a, a way to, uh, 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 to uh, assess the risks. Um, uh, because we cannot work with, uh, with the community using you know, traditional banking uh, uh, um, uh, mechanisms through collateral or um, what have you, because you know most of them don't have enough assets to uh, to be used for collateral. Um, so we use uh, we usually use cash flow as uh, as, as a way to um, um, assess the and manage the risks. Um, and uh, most of them are also already highly indebted. Um, um, they've been so used to actually using the service of lion sharks uh, with very very high cost of uh, uh, money. Um, so um, it is uh, not easy to actually uh, to serve them financially. Um, we need to um, uh, do f um, uh, risk um, assessment, very similar with probably insurance companies would do that. You know, uh, uh, assuming that some of them will default, but it won't bring down the entire group. That's basically uh, uh, mostly how the uh, how things work. Um, the issue of um, of ordinarial, um, uh, we are talking about, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, something that this has not been proven before, and uh, 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 you know, work that is very different from investing in a restaurant or a factory. Um, uh, we're to uh, we're talking about the smallholders, and therefore, five years, the usual. Uh, tenure that uh, that uh, uh, bankers or investors are looking at really is in quite um, a lot of cases too short and we need more or longer uh, tenures than, than five years. Uh, upscaling, you know, how to uh, be able to work in smaller areas but immediately uh, scale it up um, at the much larger scale because we, we you know, uh, it would be good and uh, uh, easy enough to work in like 10 villages. But we need to actually bring uh, 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 this system to reach as many smallholders as possible. And there are one and a half million of uh, smallholders, for example, in Indonesia. How are we going to reach at least most of them, if not all of them? Um, issues of legality, you know. I mean, we're talking about asset to, uh, uh, for uh, uh, collaterals, but most of them don't even have legal assets. You know, their their land, uh, they've been um, using it for probably more than 20, 30 years, but they don't have the documentation that they actually own the land. How are we going to deal with that? Um, that's it, though. These are usually the uh, the 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 factors that scare off a lot of investors. And that is why we would like to try to bridge them. Uh, what Blan how Blantara works is that we have a fund, um, a substantial amount, uh, I think, for, uh, already for the time being. Uh, and then we uh, uh, disburse the fund into um, at least three uh, windows. The first is grants. We actually provide grants. And we are talking about first 
you know, co-financing partnership grants, for example, that uh, we do with uh, a number of our our, our, um, our uh, partners, IDH, for example, for, from, from the Netherlands, um, has been our partner. Uh, we uh, actually put one-to-one -one, uh, uh, co-financing for some of um, our projects. Um, and then we also have small grants. Uh, we even divide the small grants into mini grants, micro grants, and super micro grants. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're talking about $500 or thousand dollars that would go a long way in some uh, some some areas when it uh, uh, when it's uh, put uh, effectively and in the right place and then the second is investment we also uh, provide investment we invest in uh, 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 initiatives that make money and in many cases like uh, even even small hardy development it does make money the communities actually make more money when they are uh, when they're successful in this program than before and because of that, they have uh, uh, increased revenue, they have increased income, they have uh, uh, increased profit, and it is actually an investable uh, uh, venture. And uh, we are also uh, 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 interested in doing that. But I think what is, uh, what is um, um, really interesting, I think, that we can offer is what we call de-risking facility. What we are doing now is basically to partner with impact investors and uh, 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 quite a lot of investors actually are already uh, 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 excited about coming into Indonesia and invest in some of the landscapes, but are still reluctant uh, because of certain risks. And what we're doing basically is to tell them, okay, let's partner, let's reallocate the risks. We would be uh, willing to take some of your risks if you're not comfortable taking, and just take the risks that you are comfortable with. And that would increase their appetite. That would basically uh, uh, accelerate the, uh, their, um, uh, their, their operations in Indonesia. And some of the risks are actually local risks, the ones that I just mentioned earlier that uh, you know, I would say most uh, impact investors would have no clue how to, how to deal with them. And uh, we have some uh, 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 good um, experiences with our NGO partners, how to manage them, um, and therefore we would be more comfortable taking those risks. Uh, can we stop there? Uh, sure. OK, all right. I goes, Actually, yeah, I am stopping this, there. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, because <laughs> with, with this very interesting concept of the risk and investments by sure. also taking more concerted efforts of players at the at the landscape and that sure. probably is a, is a new way to go okay no? sure okay. sure okay can, can we move to obadia because also you are trying to well working with financial institutions but also dealing with climate change risks you no know, and supporting farmers to invest more on, on soil and, and land conservation can, can you tell us what sort of mechanisms you put in place that are working <coughs> okay thank you uh just in addressing these questions, uh, allow me briefly to uh, to give a highlight of what F3 Life is. Uh, well, in F3 Life, we are financial institutions and we help financial institutions, companies, NGOs, uh, and credit providers uh, provide credit which promote sustainable and climate resilient agriculture. Uh, we do this by helping credit providers to incorporate uh, climate smart environmental, uh, climate smart and env agricultural environmental uh, uh, terms in loan terms uh, and credit scoring. Uh, we, <coughs> we, do, we provide this because uh, angry, angry environmental financial institutions actually are posed by risks. And these risks actually prevent them, uh, prevent them from uh, providing credit to smallholder farmers. So uh, what we have come to do is to provide mechanisms that helps financial institutions to provide credit to smallholder farmers. Uh, this new initiative, uh, we, develop, we developed it uh, by spending some time negotiating for uh, payment for ecosystem services in Kenya. And from that, we learned that uh, 
uh, contract designs, uh, contra I mean contract incentives supported by advice are a very important uh, tool for uh, behavior change by smallholder farmers to embrace uh, climate smart agriculture. And we also realize that direct payments to farmers are not uh, scalable. So we came up with F3 Life system whereby uh, we provide the improved sustainable and climate resilient farming in a way that is more scalable, financially sustainable. And this is uh, where farmers also repay their loans with interest. Uh, to address his question is how these risks are managed. Uh, is first to, to understand which risks are we talking about here. Uh, from a field perspective, where I come from, uh, one of the risks that uh, embrace financial institutions in providing credit to smallholder farmers is the investment finance. And as Silvia mentioned, uh, a breaded finance which comprise of private finance and public finance is very important because uh, a public finance will buffer the private finance such that uh, the pri private inf investors will not be hurt in case there's a loss. Secondary, there's a, a risk of harsh weather conditions. And this can be managed by partnering with weather indexed insurance organizations, which can caution uh, smallholder farmers in case there's extreme harsh conditions, which are brought about by those weather, harsh weather conditions. Uh, there's also uh, an issue of low uptake, uh, whereby uh, financial institutions and uh, smallholder farmers actually do have a problem of uptaking the new initiatives, and that can be uh, can be managed or mitigated by providing a technical assistance as a value addition to providing the credit to smallholder farmers. And for financial institutions, this helps them to embrace the new, I mean, the new, the, the, the new initiatives. Uh, there's also a problem of a compliance. Uh, compliance in the sense that uh, these new initiatives uh, need to actually co uh, fulfill that uh, financial institutions are in compliance with uh, what we call uh, environmental terms in their own terms. And smallholder farmers are also compliant with what they have agreed in the contract. So that requires some light uh, and tested tools and also processes which are put in place to ensure that compliance is, is managed. Uh, additionally, uh, these new initiatives, uh, which are scaled in different contexts, need to be well designed so that they can fit in different contexts. Uh, uh, getting back into how these uh, finances can help uh, small smallholder farmers in uh, uh, in mobilizing uh, funds, at the same time having soil and water conservation within uh, their agricultural system, uh, it's it's good to recognize uh, to realize that uh, smallholder farmers globally uh, lack access to finance, and they lack access to I mean, for a lack of finance to improve their. Uh, natural-based enterprises. And therefore, because of that problem, they are perceived very, very, very risky by credit providers. And therefore, uh, financial institutions don't provide credit to smallholder farmers because of that risk aspect of that. Uh, reason is that they are greatly affected by, environment, uh, by climate related shocks, which also affect their financial uh, viability. And therefore, uh, finances can be designed <laughs> in a way that they provide a very strong incentives for behavior, behavior change uh, to natural resource management. Specifically here, uh, it is very important to have a design of uh, 
of a finance system that incentivizes these smallholder farmers to embrace uh, to embrace this natural resource management, especially soil and water management. Uh, one is that they provide a very uh, important environmental restoration mechanism uh, if they are taken uh, as a condition to access credit. Additionally, these finances, which are well designed, also helps farmers to finance developmental income generating uh, assets, which also help to improve environment and they facilitate uh, provision of ecosystem services. I believe this is the future of uh, environmental finance because uh, it secures improved environmental uh, sustainability and also a sustainable financial model where those finances are recycled. So the farmer gets credit, they are provided that credit with an environmental condition so they abide by some environmental conditions. They do ABCD to access incremental credit which helps them uh, to finance their assets. At the same time, they improve their environment. Uh, just to give an example, we did learn a, a, a pilot for a period of three years in Kenya uh, where we are providing credit to smallholder farmers and that credit had environmental condition pegged into their own terms such that farmers would access increasing credit at low interest rates and they were required to do some land restoration activities. Once they abide by that, they will access incremental credit at lower interest rates. Uh, that was successful uh, because in comparison with other conventional agri-environmental uh, projects, we had a very high demand for credit. We also had a 100% rate of success in comparison with a very low rate of uh, success for these other conventional agri-environmental uh, projects. Thank you, Abadia. Uh, we, we have to move on. I, I have to cut. I'm, um, I'm sorry. It's okay, thank you. Uh, but then I would like to move with uh, Christian, and also because you have put in place these uh, schemes that are also uh, trying to to deal with uh, providing finance for s improving sus sustainability of production systems, but also including conservation in ways that involve smallholders and may benefit and create opportunities for the smallholders. Can, can you a bit? elaborate on these schemes and the challenges and, and what's working well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and um, thank you, Pablo. And if, and if I can interpret the question a little bit and just sort of distill it down into a sort of a simple thing based and also make it relevant to what we've been listening to uh, from, from the other panelists. Well, okay, we, we kind of know that we know empirically and scientifically that smallholders, you know, as so many of them are on the front lines, really, you know, a, a, a <clears throat> of climate change and biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. They, they, they need to be given access or they need to receive access to um, the necessary input so that their operations can be improved and, and made more resilient uh, uh, when, when some of these um, uh, impacts you know, inevitably start coming their way. They, so they need that, but equally, um, that's information that we have and, you know, organizations who are professional who work in the field like S&V and so forth. But the millions and millions and millions of smallholders out there, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a very asymmetrical level of knowledge and, and even enthusiasm for taking on new sort of, um, you know, new business practices. I mean, some of them are, are very eager and very well informed, but equally some of them haven't benefited from uh, some of the knowledge sh sharing that is so important. So um, what it really comes down to, I think, is well, what, what's, what's the pitch for, from an impact investor to uh, a group of smallholders? Um, what, what are they going to get out of it? I mean, we, we heard from August that, that, yes, absolutely, productivity increases can um, uh, when, when, when project performance is, uh, is, is within the sort of target range can 
can really benefit them and create new income streams and so forth and really make their lands more, more suitable for, for agriculture over time. Um, that's all great, but equally we know as, <laughs> we know as the urban elite, if I can borrow that term uh, from so many politicians now, we know that um, inertia and cognitive dissonance and so forth are very powerful forces in our own lives, our own societies rather. So getting people to change is a tough one. Um, so I think we better well go in there with a very good proposition for them and that's easy to understand and doesn't require them completing a PhD before they are able to, you know, to really sit down and, and have a, a, an informed conversation. So going back to my sort of putting my asset manager's hat back on instead of my sort of citizen's hat, um, a lot of this comes down to risk and fiduciary responsibility as well. Um, I think that because in so many sort of traditional finance circles, um, finance is, is offered by professional financing institution, banks and project financiers, etc., etc., to um, organizations that are professional, they have a, a, a professional uh, uh, established counterparty set up, they are seeking finance, they know exactly what sort of deal that is good for them and that, that they and their investors, their shareholders rather, are, are willing to do. So they come to the finance, financial services sector and say, this is the deal, here's your opportunity. Mr. Investment Banker, do you want to do you want to take me to the street and get me finance? Maybe it's an IPO, maybe it's just a private placement, what have you. But generally, you're dealing with with um, willing and eager um, counterparties who are seeking that sort of financial support. Occasionally, you know, I'm thinking of like Gordon Gecko and in, in, in Blue Star Airlines. You know, it's like a corporate raider sort of thing. But that's that, that's Hollywood. And but that you know, in any case, normally it is um, a, a relationship of equals. Okay, so we're going out there and we, we need to have a, a, a pitch to these guys. And um, I'm going to, I wasn't quite sure how to tackle the question, Pablo, to be honest with you, but I'm going to, uh, uh, because we're not raising capital for our Thelia Climate Fund, I can't be accused of making this some sort of um, attention grabbing sort of, you know, self, um, you know, sort of pitch of, of Thelia. It's not. But I think this year we've released our first annual uh, impact report. And this has been something that investors have been long looking at, looking for, uh, understandably, because everyone in the impact investing field, as I'm sure, Sylvia, you would agree, is very interested in understanding the relationship between investment and impact. And what is that algorithm that sits there? And I'm not sure we have an algorithm, but I think that what we, we have um, been able to demonstrate in our first um, uh, uh, impact report in 2016 is that these are real and understandable um, products uh, or, or, or outcomes as opposed to um, what we uh, inevitably, we and everybody else who was trying to build this new sector over the last few years had to rely on, and that was simple projections. So the impacts are, yeah, there are some projections in there, but I think they're real, and, and to, to speak to your question, I think that but by a quick summary, if I may, of, 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 of um, some of the impacts we've achieved along the seven impact reporting themes that we operate with, um, they're certainly tangible and they are life improving to, to um, some of the people that we're, that we're happy to, to work with. So, so our, our, our seven themes, um, well, I'll walk you through them. The first one is climate. Obviously, we know that deforestation and land use change is accounting for 20% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally, give or take X, Y, Z, and it has huge impacts on livelihoods and biodiversity and, 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 and whatnot. Um, so right now, um, uh, across our portfolio, which is about 70% uh, deployed, um, we are financing the protection of, of over 2 million hectares of critical ecosystems. Um, we have been, through that, through that protection, uh, we've been pivotable, pivot, pivotable, pivotal, pivotal, uh, in avoiding um, about 14 million tons of CO, CO2 emissions uh, to date. And, and this, is, this is where I think it gets really interesting from a smallholder's perspective. The main sort of um, strategy we do is to, is to operate in that nexus between uh, production and protection. Um, and and you know, we don't really come in with a pure protection um, uh, offering. We think that's fine and, and, and we have nothing against that, but I think when you're talking about food security and, and the aspiration, uh, which is rightly um, uh, um, um, to be found in people across the world, I think you've got to always reconcile production with protection. And um, we have over 30,000 hectares of, uh, of sustainable integrated agroforestry systems that we've financed with our partners um, in and around the, the core protected areas in which we're also operating. So these, these protected, um, I'm sorry, these buffer areas might separate the protected area from, say, 
a, a paved road that might separate the protected area from where uh, you know, development patterns patterns are starting to really spiral out of control. Um, and it, you know, and, and I'll get to the to the impacts of having those uh, integrated agroforestry systems, but they're real, and in our view, they're they're one of the big engines, if not the biggest engine, um, for um, empowering uh, the protection. Moving over to ecosystems, it's you know I think the the, the red the red crowd uh, who you know, I consider myself amongst the red crowd if you will and a lot of friends in the red crowd and probably you guys do too, but oftentimes we have historically fallen into a trap, particularly those in Europe and America, of thinking of red purely through a carbon lens. We all know in our heads cognitively that of course forests uh, and other natural ecosystems are far more than just CO2 molecules, um, but it's it, you know as part of our impact um, uh, investment screening and impact measurement, we really go past just the carbon to look at the ecosystems. So I mentioned two, ma two million hectares of, of critical ecosystems. Most of those in our portfolio are actually classed domestically um, by, by the authorities as high conservation value. Um, we, um, we also have, a, as part of our deal selection and our, and our strategy of even, uh, you know, kind of stringing uh, deals in one country together, um, like Peru, for instance, we do try to build corridors of connectivity between um, important um, ecosystems. We also um, uh, make sure that if there are important ecosystems that are nearby, we bring those into the project, even if they might not be absolutely mission critical for the project to succeed from, say, a financial perspective. So as an example, in Monte Grosso, we're going ahead and, and, and building into the project the protection of 720 hectares of riparian forests um, in and around uh, the sustainable cattle ranches that we finance. Now, in actual fact, that's good because Protecting the riverine forests, we know, is very important for the health of the water table and the river and, and local biodiversity. But equally, um, one could in invest in, in, in productivity improvements in pastures without going to the additional um, uh, efforts and expense of, of, of focusing on um, additional ecosystems. Moving over to species, which is effectively the building block of, of, of ecosystems, um, we, we know we're in the biggest uh, sort of, you know, the, the sort of the biggest round of extinctions in millions and millions and millions of years. It's called the sixth, sixth extinction for a very good reason. And this is brought about by human behavior. This is the Anthropocene uh, uh, era that we have uh, initiated. Um, in our portfolio, um, we are funding the protection of habitat for 111 species at last count um, that are endangered or vulnerable according to the IUCN Red List. Um, we are receiving reports on this and, and there's actual project you know, project funds that are allocated to um, activities that foster an enhanced conservation status for these species. Four of those are actually evolutionarily distinct and they are also globally in endangered. There's a program called EDGE uh, that uh, documents unique or endemic species um, with a level of endangerment. And we are actually f happy to find out that in Peru we've had a new species, a species of um, legless lizard named after Althelia, which is uh, nice. I mean. Um, he's, he's quite cute, actually. Um, we, um, we're also really b a big believer in technology as part of this, and we think that the, the, this, you know, using a technological approach, empowering communities to do a lot of the work themselves is absolutely crucial, not only for effectiveness on the ground, but it also parlays very nicely into um, livelihoods, because by deploying new technologies can, that can be used for monitoring of not only carbon but biodiversity, et cetera. Um, you're empowering people to learn new trades that they otherwise wouldn't be doing, and, uh, and, and that involves funding education programs and so forth. Um, and, it's, and it's quite exciting. I mean, it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's keeping, keeping it relevant, but it's also keeping it quite exciting and, and uh, as a potential to generate new forms of income in, in, in the form of new jobs. So that, that brings me to livelihoods. Um, I'm going to try to quick, you know, kind of pick up the pace here. Um, but um, thus far, we have either created or supported 1,279 jobs across the portfolio. It's actually more than that now because this pu uh, report was published uh, before our last investment was executed. Um, and our, su our sustainable commodity production just in cocoa in Peru right now is about 4,000 hectares. Um, under uh, un, uh, under planting, so we've we've got about 400 in the ground now, and and uh, we'll have 1,500 by I believe. If don't don't hold me to this, but I believe it's Q2 next year, um, with a on a pathway to 4,000 around the Tampa Pata National Park. Um, one of our project partners in Guatemala has as one of its project aims, and it's what we signed off on, um, is to double incomes 
um, uh, at the household level across the entire project area. And, and I think that is something that makes conservation, it makes climate change, and it makes, it makes this relevant to people in their daily lives, just like the voters in Europe and America I mean, making decisions on what's actually their perception of relevance to them tomorrow. You know, people are the same the world over, and I think um, you know, sometimes climate change, because it does per it's perceived to be long-term horizon, you need to make it relevant today, and, and you need to make sure that your investments are achieving those impacts impacts that, that Argus and, and, and Richard uh, um, and others have mentioned are, are possible. Um, inclusivity, um, um, that's, a, that's another word for gender, really. I mean, we, we want to make sure that um, it's not just the actual guys with the spades and the shovels and who are doing the farming <coughs> in the fields who are working with us. I mean, we, we do take a, an integrated approach uh, to the entire community. Um, uh, across our portfolio, I think about one third of the jobs that we've created thus far, or helped create thus far, are um, are um, taken uh, by women, which I think is fantastic, and that's a measured, a, a measurable improvement against business as usual. Um, we. Um, work with the government on um, using existing tools like quality of life plans um, in San Martin around Cordillera Azul, and this goes much deeper, again, away from, from just climate change. Okay. Um, Last thing I'll say, we are currently supporting 51 productive enterprises and businesses um, in and around the agroforestry space. So that's 51 companies that are either started up or were, have been fostered, helped, supported, furthered due to the investments um, that we've made. And I think that sort of is my sort of pitch, I guess, to, um, to smallholders um, uh, who, who maybe want to hear something a little bit more tangible than just, uh, I'm going to increase your livelihood. Because yeah, I, I thank think you. it's great to hear all, all the impacts that, that you have in place. And, and, and for me, it's a bit, uh, well, easy to see these impacts in some sectors. You know, when you have these high value tree crops, cocoa, oil palm, more, more dynamic markets, that is probably easier to build business models that could deliver benefits to smallholders that can be resources that can be invested in conservation. But I think, well, let's move to OLAM. And I think the OLAM case is quite interesting because also, well, you are not operating with this high value crops, but well, you have a very large portfolio of, of crops that, that you manage and also building these outgrower schemes with smallholders. And also you are able to transfer finance and other technical services to smallholders while also ensuring offtake markets. So it's an interesting concept. And could you tell us what's, what's, what are the key of the success of, of this model and how it works across different contexts? Well, it's very much a blueprint that you apply to all the operations that you have. Yeah, if I told you the key, I'd probably get sacked. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you some, some background that might, uh, might give you an idea. Uh, so good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm Chris uh, from a company called Olam. Um, some of you may have heard, some of you may not have heard about Olam. Um, we started life in 1989. So we're, we're a young company. We're 26 years old. Uh, so compared to the competition, um, who are over centuries old, we're, we're, we're a young kid. Um, so we're, we're sort of learning as we go along, um, and, but learning from mistakes as well, doing some really good things, we think. Um, so we started life in Nigeria, exporting cashew nuts. So one country, one crop. We're now in 70 countries. Uh, we're in about 16 agricultural commodities. Um, we work with farmers. We have our own farms and plantations. We have about 200 processing plants. Um, so we're vertically integrated. If we think about the, the supply chain, um, we work with about 4 million smallholder farmers, uh, 20,000 large-scale farmers as well. But let's, let's focus on, on supply chain and, and su smallholder in particular. The supply chain amounts for about 9.5 million hectares of land as well. Um, it's 92% of our greenhouse gas footprint. It's 98% of our water footprint. It's material to our business. It's material to what we need to do in terms of delivering um, our contribution to, to the Paris Climate Agreement, to, to delivering on, on why we're here today, uh, delivering action. Of those smallholder farmers, um, that, that land uh, amounts to about 7.5 million hectares. Um, most of this is, is through countries in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, India. Um, these are farmers with probably about two hectares of land. 
um, that, we, that we have to work with uh, to get the range of products. The products do include cocoa. So one in three chocolate bars contains cocoa from Olam. Um, we source enough cotton to make about five billion t-shirts a year. And um, just trying to think now, um, rice, we can provide everybody in the world with two portions of rice. So again, to give you an idea of scale um, of the products that, that we're dealing in as well, and, and the challenges that go with some of those products as well. In terms of working with smallholders, we, we realized very early on in, in 1989 that it's not just about agricultural inputs. It's, it's not just um, about um, seeds and, and fertilizer. It's about the farmer. It's about the communities in which they live and work. Our business, our supply chain business, is dependent on those farmers. We need to ensure that that, that dependency um, isn't a risk. So it's how do we how do we de-risk um, that that dependent uh, value chain? So the farmers are dependent on us as off-takers. We're dependent on the farmers for, for our business. And that might be because those products feed into our processing plants. They might be outgrowers associated with a, a, a nucleus farm, which I'll mention shortly. Um, so we, we built a, an organized a program called the Olam Livelihood Charter. It's based around eight fairly simple principles, looking at things like yield and quality, the obvious ones for a business like us. Uh, but then going down to, to think about trans, uh, traceability, uh, social infrastructure, environmental impact. So building that enabling environment out from the farm, around the farm, into the community and beyond. So I guess listening to, to, to the colleagues here and, and, and hearing about bridges, Olam is, is, is both a, a bridge in terms of credit, it's also a bridge in terms of knowledge and, and support. And I'll, I'll say knowledge and support because the teams on the ground are physically on the ground. So our, our teams in, uh, in, in Ghana, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Gabon, in Mozambique, in Indonesia, India, the list goes on. Those people live pretty much in the communities in which they operate. Um, so, so it's about understanding inherently what's happening on the ground, what is happening with regards to the lives, the livelihoods of our suppliers, and how can we build that, that long-term strong relationship um, as an off-taker and to improve yield and quality. But how do we build that long-term relationship? And uh, we've seen, obviously, finance as a, as a key problem in this space. Um, so Olam uh, ourselves have, have, have stepped in uh, into that space, and, and, and this again was from day one. We were a trading organisation to begin with, so we've got a bunch of traders on the ground who know about who know about money, who know about deals, who know about risks of, of people who can who can pay back. Um, so we, last year we uh, we financed 177 million dollars um, through the just through the Olam Livelihood Charter. So that's about 340, 350 thousand farmers um, that satisfy all of the requirements for that sustainability program. Outside of that program, uh, probably another 650,000 smallholder farmers um, that, we, that we work with, um, that we're, we're financing, providing inputs. So about a million farmers we're connected to delivering finance and other services, um, some of which reach the, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the gold standard, if you will. Um, and, and satisfy all of the various requirements that can very quickly be turned into a certified product. But it's about long-term sustainable supply chains that we're looking to deliver. And that finance goes into things like um, buying oxen, um, buying, buying plows. So uh, the cotton team in Cote d'Ivoire have, have allowed the financing of, of 12,000 oxen, 4,000 plows. It's things that the farmers need to support the work that they need to do or their communities need as well. And that's where the local knowledge piece comes in. And th as I say, those staff are trained to understand about risk of the farmers. What is the risk that those farmers are able to take and how do we support that? Um, so in effect, what we're also doing is building a farmer credit history. Um, so we can then bring in, as we have, um, sort of three-way agreements with, with banks and other input companies um, to, to share the risk. Uh, we can't shoulder everything. I mean, we've, we've tried to shoulder everything. Um, and it, it is business risk. So it's how can we, how can we de-risk by bringing people in? Um, I probably forgot to mention as well that those, that financing is, is either zero interest or, or minimal interest as well. Um, so it's affordable. 
Um, so this is, again, understanding the capabilities of people to pay back. Um, of the smallholder volume, about 23% of that smallholder volume is in the OLC. Um, so getting on for a quarter, and then you tag on that with the 650. So we've got reach to, to a huge proportion of our smallholder value chain in terms of being able to provide <coughs> finance into them. Uh, in terms of funding for other activities that can be delivered, um, we were able to mobilize some quite significant funding uh, from, from government, from development finance institutions. Um, but 80% of that donor funding comes from our customers, our clients, which I find quite amazing, actually. 80% is, is client-driven. So we're sitting here today talking about the, the, the big picture, or for the last week or so, uh, the big picture, the role of government. 80% is coming from our customers. So, so again, there's a there's huge opportunity to say, here's the art of what's possible. Now, how do we bring in, how do we access um, even greater finance and funding uh, to deliver into that space? So a bit of an a, a explanation around, around how we're working with, with the smallholders. And then I'd, I'd also mention nucleus operations. And this, this taps into the fact that we have our own farms, we have our own uh, processing plants. So we're investing in those assets for 20, 30 plus years. We need those supply chains to be around for 20, 30 plus years. It's, it's, it's a fairly common sense approach, really. Um, so this allows us then to go out and build those supply chains, to really invest in those supply chains, to understand what those supply chains need for that 20, 30 plus year investment period. Um, so again, it's, it's locking us in to working with the smallholders and those supply chains. Um, products like cashew, uh, going back to cashew as the original product, uh, 57, yeah, 57,000 farmers in, in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, um, all within the OLM Livelihood Charter. So it's virtually all of the cashew volume that we, that we do. Um, then we have, we have sugar farmers in India um, producing over just under 890,000 tons of sugar. Um, so sizable, sizable operations here, working with smallholders um, that we're able to do. And then uh, future uh, smallholder programs in Gabon, um, where we're working in a, a public-private partnership with the government um, to, to really build uh, a rural agricultural economy that doesn't exist at the moment, but in the right way. Again, how do you develop land, looking at high conservation value, free primary informed consent, um, ensuring that that land is suitable going forward into the future and we're not just handing land over that's not going to be uh, sustainable in its own right in the future. And then working in Thailand on rice um, as part of the Better Rice Initiative. And, and it, again, things like rice, huge greenhouse gas mitigation potential there if we get it right. Uh, and that can be scalable um, through, through Thailand, which I think at the moment is probably our largest uh, sourcing origin, but then it can be scaled out through through the rest of the supply chain. And we're the second largest exporter of rice globally. So it's really about unlocking mutual value, finding that value, unlocking it, and building those long-term relationships. And that, that's really been the basis of, of how OLAM has, has developed its whole supply chain uh, business. Thank, thank you, Chris. No, it's interesting and impressive to, to, to listen how you have been really able to overcome constraints and to build these operations to scale on mobilizing the potential of, of the supply chains to do that, which is very interesting. But, well, we have a few minutes left. Well, we think we didn't manage quite well the time, given the large number of speakers. But I think we have time for, for a round of, of questions that you would like to, to post to, to our panelists. And I will take probably two, three questions. I'm going to try to ask the blockchain question. Uh, which is the technology that Bitcoin is built on, digital currency. It was at an event where the blockchain question was asked and none of the panel knew what it was, but about eight people in the audience were developing uh, solutions on the blockchain. But <laughs> anyway, I mean, for example, with Olam, you know, your problems with financing smallholders are currency risk and transaction <coughs> cost. Whereas if you were to take a massive community of smallholders and offer to finance them through mobile devices with a digital currency at such a scale that their community could almost start trading the digital currency. You would wipe out your local currency risk and your transaction cost. I mean, who's thinking of 
You know, in, you know, in two years, 70% of the banking industry as we know it will be gone or unrecognizable because of this technology. Who's thinking of these paradigm shifts? I've got the mic, so I, I can jump in. If we're going to answer straight, or do you want, are you going to gather a few uh, questions? But if, if there are no more questions <coughs> that you may ask, because there's not too much time left. Yep. My name is Tim Tendikert from Unique Force and Land Use. I would like to ask a question where we stand in terms of performance. And performance in how much private sector money we can leverage with public investments and do we make progress on this and the second kind of performance is um, in terms of how can we link the smallholders to, to the markets and and um, Christian started with with giving some ideas on on his impact but maybe to get an idea where where the performance stand and where you think you will be in the next five years on these issues Is, are there some more questions? Okay, so let's go back with the question. I think Chris, you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first because it's, it's work that we are doing. Um, again, managing information from, let's say, a, a, a million, keep it a nice round number, a million smallholders um, is or has become a, become a challenge, obviously. Um, and so we, we've built and, and, and Many organizations and companies are doing similar, utilizing uh, Android app, um, uh, farmer surveys, getting all, all, all the information based on the farm, on the, the livelihoods of the farm, looking at the transaction um, history as well. Um, but the, yeah, the, 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 the question of the moment that we're um, speaking with lots of people around is, is, is that transaction, is, is e-money? Um, how, how do we do that? Um, there are, are organisations out there um, that are, um, uh, are, are funding uh, invest, uh, research into this. We've recently um, uh, gone through a, a, a round with the Mastercard Foundation, and we, we've got uh, funding uh, to proceed down down this route. Um, so again, we see this as a game changer. How do you? Uh, we have we have guys going out on motorbikes handing cash over, um, and, and that's that's the model. That's how it started. That that's how it is, and that's how it is in most businesses. How do, you, how, do you, how do you make that leap? Um, so it is, it is very much this, and again, building on from just a farmer information system that gives you a farm management plan, a bespoke farm management plan for the farmer, um, that's fine. But it's how do we leverage the technology opportunities that are out there now that's really exciting. And, and really that, that paradigm shift in terms of banking sector is, is I, I think, uh, for, for the rural community, is going is to be phenomenal change. And, and change for the good as well. Thanks, Chris. Sylvia, probably you may like to address this from Tim. question on performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be, to be very honest and, and, and clear, um, we could leverage, we could get much, much more funding in at this point in time from the private sector uh, if we would have basically the pipeline to place it. Um, we, we actually have, at this point in time, pushed back. Um, uh, because of the size, I mean, issues. I mean, we, we had requests, for example, to take on board 50 million at once, which is, for us at present, too much uh, to deal with. Um, but also on an aggregated basis, we could do much, much more than what we currently do. So the, the issue is really more the, the pipeline issue uh, to, to place the funds uh, effectively and, uh, and efficiently. Richard, would you like to add on the question of performance and how you monitor performance and how critical that can be? Uh, sure. <coughs> um, well, the, in SNV, we have the, probably as you know, we, we, we have the inclusive business approach where we um, work with the companies to then integrate the smallholders into the, the company supply chain um, and all the different groups along the supply chain, the value chain, to try to integrate or improve the the relationship of all the different groups along that supply chain. Um, and then within that, we have clear monitoring systems and, and mechanisms to, to, uh, to, to monitor performance. So we have a quite a clear approach that we use for, for any commodity or, or company we work with. Uh, are there more questions? Uh, um. 
question is mostly for Chris from Olam, but I think Annie could uh, answer that. One thing I've heard about the issue of, of working with smallholder farmers is, is, is aggregation. And you talked about some high value crops, but when we think about sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it, it's uh, uh, staple crops. And so um, I've talked to people at, at, for example, Cargill, and how do you get corn you know, from that many uh, uh, smallholder farmers and do it in a, in a cost effective way? I'm just curious your thoughts or others, how we can you know, make this reach uh, other commodities. Uh, I mean, our, our approach is, is fairly transparent. I mean, it's it, it's about it's about getting out there, it's getting boots on the ground, it's it, it's it's putting in the hard yards, really. Um, and when I when I go around the the business and and visit visit the teams on the ground, um, it is parachuting people in in many cases into the middle of nowhere and building a business um, in in places that some people just haven't heard of. Um, and didn't know existed, and it, it, it is, it's, it's just hard work, but the, it's transparent in terms of what we do. Um, over these last few years, um, I think we've, um, we've felt a certain maturity in, in terms of being able to come out and communicate about it. So it, it only really started in 2010. We underwent um, a, a, a strategic change uh, probably eight or so, eight or nine years ago, moving from a trading business into this vertically integrated business. Um, so I think that, that gives us advantages um, over a, a straight sourcing and, and trading company. Um, but there are other things happening. Um, I'm a, or Olam is a member of uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We're having conversations um, around trying to develop a, a soft commodities club um, that, can, that can talk about pre-competitive issues um, that... How, how the heck do you work with smallholders? It's uh, let's 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 try and figure that out. Um, and then there's also something called the Global Agribusiness Alliance that was recently launched. Um, that again is 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 trying to bring in more of the players in the in the supply side of the business and focus on the challenges there. And at the the recent launch, the uh, the the one theme that that was was resounding. Well, two actually. Um, one was smallholders. The second was gender. Um, because the, the launch panel of, of, I think it was 12 CEOs on the stage, were all men. And it's like, crikey, what's going on? Uh, so, so smallholders and gender. Um, so there are now some, some collaborative um, vehicles, hopefully, uh, to start building that conversation and really get into the nub of the problem. Um, so I think it's, it's also something that's, um, that, that's demand-driven. Um, so what are the customers asking for? How do we create that demand? So we're now in a... In a in a post-Paris climate agreement world. We're now in an SDG world. So there's been certain changes over this last year or so that are really building that framework uh, within which we can work, uh, not just the supply side, but also on the, on the consumer-facing side and civil society um, and, and public sector. Thank you, Chris. Well, we are over time. So before to close the session, I would like to ask all the panelists going from my left to my far left, what do you think has been the main innovation in the operations that has worked and you want to keep pursuing? Um, the short answer is I think um, we've found a way to operate in that missing middle that I believe uh, Richard spoke of. In fact, uh, you robbed me of my throwaway uh, phrase there, but that's okay, you set the stage. Um, you know, I think, I think that uh, there's a very short list of uh, organizations out there that understand some of the demands of div delivering finance that works for the climate, it works for, for people on the ground, it works for biodiversity, conservation, etc. And uh, it takes a, a different approach both temporally uh, and also an understanding of risk. So I think we have found that missing middle and I hope that others continue to join us um, at, at a rapid pace because God knows uh, the climate needs it. Yeah, I think uh, I'm probably echoing uh, the, the, the words there and, and in terms of, uh, you know, from our experience really is uh, the, the risks and the difficulties of, of meeting climate, uh, social, environmental, deforestation free. I mean, this is all, uh, you know, major costs which need to be overcome and it's, there's no simple uh, solution of, uh, of financing or impact investment, that, but quite often there needs to be a lot of investment on the enabling conditions and, and other costs on the ground. So I think as more and more models come through, it'll, it'll become um, easier and, and more interest to, to replicate, but certainly, um, yeah, that, that's a key, key issue for us. 
one thing I'd like to highlight is um, that of uh, social capital. I think um, uh, uh, the way things work uh, on the ground is um, um, uh, entirely based um, uh, on the level of trust. The more trusting you are with each other, the, uh, the easier it is to to work together. And um, you know, be it um, uh, 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 you know opening uh, uh, businesses or developing um, uh, very you know developing. Um, uh, effective um, uh, agricultural um, um, uh, work, you know, it uh, boils down to the community and boils down to trust among each other. Yeah, uh, my, my take is that uh, uh, it's, it's very important to understand the needs of the, the community or uh, the target group that you want to introduce in a new initiative into. And having gotten that understanding, uh, you also design uh, that product that you want to get to the market uh, exactly tailored into the need of the target group. And once that is, when that is done, uh, then you have uh, the group that you, you, you are targeting uh, actually own the initiative. And they are, they are then, after owning the initiative, at least it's very good to benefit them and also the uptake will be very high. Additionally, in the last three, is to have a very high touch with the group that you are targeting and also impacting. Okay. But to make it very brief, um, I started off with describing the innovation that we did at the level of mobilizing funds. But I think what is probably the even greater achievement is um, that we have a very inclusive approach to find local intermediaries because this is actually critical. Uh, you know, if you want to place money effectively, you need those on the ground that can actually do it, you know, like Olam, for example, but also um, financial intermediaries. I mean, these are that shake actually the cash flows in the country. Uh, and there, I think we have been quite successful in actually incorporating sustainable practice um, indicators as an element of the risk assessment. I mean, you would wonder that, that actually most of the bankers we've been talking to uh, at the beginning of the discussions, they were not aware of what's going on out there in terms of, uh, you know, certificates and in terms of, you know, multinationals committing to deforestation-free uh, value chains and, and those kind of things. You know, they were completely blind on this. And, and I think in our work, we have made this a component and increasingly the bankers understood it's essential for them to take these issues on board, not because of you know social corporate responsibility issues and having a nice image and so on. It's their lifeline. It's their lifeline. They need to incorporate this in their risk assessment to place funds effectively where they're due, because otherwise there is no business tomorrow. Okay. I'm going to try and find something that hasn't been said, but <laughs> um, I, I guess I guess for if if I look at if I look at Olam and if I look at my team, um, I've just employed an accountant. Um, so I used to work in the in the coffee team um, in in finance. So the the corporate responsibility and sustainability function of employed an accountant, and it's to because now we understand having uh, some some. Uh, some years under our belt of doing this to be able to build and communicate in the right language the business case for sustainability. So for, for me, it, it echoes pretty much what's, what's gone before, but very much through, through my lens, it's, I think we're confident to talk about the business case for sustainability um, in a way that, that our finance teams will understand and will be on a sort of a, a level playing field when we go in. It, it won't be, it won't be corporate social responsibility, it will just be corporate responsibility and sustainability. So it's, again, it's about the business. Yeah, well, yeah, it seems that sustainability now, probably social inclusion more and more in the future is going to be part of, of the business case. I really appreciate your thoughts and the different perspectives that you have and perspectives that you are exploring about how to still bridge this, uh, well, uh, issues of equity, sustainability, risk, and, and, and profits. No, I think there are, there are multiple approaches you are trying, well, different ways in which we can still uh, scale up experiences that work. Still, we have to test this concept of the landscapes. If that's going to work, it's really going to bring different players together. There's still questions about how to move beyond these high value crops, or value tree crops, in which it probably is easier to reach outcomes. But, well, uh, well still, 
questions open for future discussions. Well, I appreciate uh, your thoughts and please give a clap of hands to the